This is the second lecture for Susan Wolf's Meaning in Life and Why It Matters. I thought of something else that I wanted to talk about, so here's another lecture. Uh, so if you look at, well, we in some of the earlier lectures, I talked about various methods of philosophy, and this article, in really in a way, a lot of the articles we've been reading, but uh, this article especially is a good example of something that we might call reflective equilibrium. And so what is that? So there's kind of like a technical definition in uh, this textbook that we have. So uh, it has a glossary, and then in the glossary it says, uh, reflective equilibrium is a method for inquiry in ethics and other areas that begins from our firmly held considered judgments about particular cases and candidate general principles. It then assesses whether our general principles are consistent with our judgments about cases and whether the principles explain and illuminate these judgments. Where there is a conflict, the investigator is to revise either the principles or judgments until the two harmonize and the principles helpfully explain and entail a set of considered judgments we regard as reasonable. Proponents of the method hold that when a stable view of this sort, an equilibrium, has been achieved through reflection, we are justified in accepting it, even if we have no independent evidence for its correctness. Uh, reflective equilibrium sometimes denotes the process of harmonizing one's particular judgments and general principles, and sometimes denotes the product of this, project, of this process, that is the equilibrium point that is sought. So that's kind of like a technical way of talking about it. Uh, the more basic way, the simpler way is, look, we're trying to understand something. Uh, in this case, we're trying to understand what is the meaning of life? Why, why does meaning in life matter? And so how are we going to do this? Well, we have kind of two things that we're working with here. One is our considered judgment. So if you just think about the meaning of life, uh, try to uh, think about some particular judgments that you have. So for instance, is a life meaningful if it's the life of a glow worm uh, sitting in a cave, like in Richard Taylor's uh, article? Or is a life meaningful if it's the life of Sisyphus pushing a boulder up a hill for eternity? Is Sisyphus's life more meaningful if he enjoys pushing the boulder up the hill than if he doesn't? Is a life, you know, let's compare two lives of real people, uh, which one is more meaningful or and why, stuff like that. So these are all considered judgments. We sort of think about various judgments we have about the meaning of life, and, you know, we make a list of them. Here's all the things we think about meaning in life. But in philosophy, we want to go further. We don't just want to figure out, like, just a bunch of things we say about the meaning of life. That won't even answer the question, what is meaning of life? What, what is the meaning of life, or why does the meaning of life matter? If we want to answer that bigger question, what we need are sort of general principles. So some sort of principle that says, this is what meaning in life is. Meaning in life is X, Y, Z. Or here is why meaning in life matters. Or here is when meaning is meaningful. It's in situation A, B, C. So we come up with principles to explain things. And we don't just do that in philosophy, we do that in science and every other field too. So for instance, scientists don't just go out and measure a bunch of stuff. Uh, they don't just collect a bunch of evidence, which are sort of similar to considered judgments. Scientists don't just make a list of all the trees or whatever. Uh, they come up with theories. So they start sorting the trees into categories and coming up with species taxonomies and explaining where the species came from and listing general properties of the species and how they fit into ecosystems. And uh, they don't just measure gravity and stuff. They come up with a theory of what gravity is and a theory of particles and stuff. So we don't just sit with our judgments or our thoughts about things. We come up with theories to explain things or principles to explain things. And so what reflective equilibrium is is it's a process where you have your considered judgments and you have some general principles and you sort of put them together and see how they fit. So let's say I have a considered judgment that Sisyphus's life is meaningless. It's just meaningless to push a rock up a hill over and over. That's a considered judgment. And let's say I also have a general principle that says a life is meaningful 
uh, the longer it lasts. The more the longer you live, the more meaningful your life is. Those two things don't fit together very well. My considered judgment that his life is meaningless says that his life has no meaning. My principle that says the longer it is, the more meaningful it is, that would say Sisyphus has a very meaningful life because he just, he lives forever. So one of those things has to go. I could give up my considered judgment. I could say, well, I thought Sisyphus's life was meaningless, but I'm pretty sure I have the correct principle. Or I could give up the principle. I could say, well, I guess maybe the longer life isn't the more meaningful life. Um, so one of those things has to get eliminated or at least changed. Maybe I could say I could change the principle that says the longer life is more meaningful, everything else held equal. But in Sisyphus's case, sort of everything is not held equal or so. I don't know. But there's lots of options. The thought is you just take these two things, you see how they match up, and then if they don't match up, something has to change. And so that's what reflective equilibrium is, basically. You take your considered judgments and some candidate principles, some sort of possible explanations of what's going on. You smush them together and see how it works out. If it works out, you're good to go. If it doesn't work out, something has to change. And so, like I said at the beginning of the lecture, really this is what a lot of the things we're reading are doing. Uh, but I think Wolf is a good example of this uh, going on. And sometimes people don't say explicitly that something has to change, they just say, oh, we must reject this principle because it doesn't fit with this judgment or something. But that's basically the process of reflective equilibrium. It's saying we have a general principle and it doesn't fit in with this judgment about how life should be. So that's a methodology for doing philosophy and it can maybe help to reflect on what do you think about this methodology as you read Wolf attempt to do it. One final thing to say about it, you might think, well, why should I care about considered judgments? Why should I care about just a bunch of stuff that I happen to think? What if I'm wrong? I could be wrong about all these judgments. So if my principle doesn't match my judgments, why shouldn't I just immediately throw my judgments in the trash? So, I mean, one thing to say is, good question. There's not like an obvious answer here, so it's worth reflecting on this. Like, what should you do with the considered judgments that you have? Maybe those don't matter at all. But uh, there's different ways of understanding what philosophy is up to, and different philosophers approach philosophy in different ways. Some philosophers think, really, philosophy's job is to help us make sense of the world as it sort of appears to us. And there's, there's only so much you can fiddle with your considered judgments before... Uh, it gets implausible. So there's only so much, if, it, if you have come up with a bunch of philosophical principles that don't fit any of our considered judgments, your two options are get rid of the principles or get rid of the judgments. And some philosophers think you're never going to have a better reason for keeping the principles than you are for keeping the judgments. The judgments are going to be the ones that stay firm, and the principles are always going to be on less firm ground. The principles are just going to be some philosophical theory you came up with by thinking, how can that ever compete with sort of your starting points, your judgments about things? So that's a sort of more conservative way of doing philosophy. Uh, but you could have the opposite view. You could say, I don't care about my considered judgments. I'm going to find the best principles that I can find. And then if that requires me to change my judgments, including like all of my judgments, maybe I thought I lived in a physical world and stuff, but really the world is composed of ideas and stuff, and then fine, I'll go with the, the principles that seem better to me rather than the judgments. Uh, and so it might be worth thinking, like, and, and those are the two extremes. Almost everybody is somewhere in the middle. Nobody, almost nobody says, I'm going to keep every single one of my considered judgments, no matter what. People are almost always open to changing at least one or two of these if some really good general principles require it. And almost nobody is willing to say, look, um, general principles just will decide everything. I'll change any of my judgments no matter what, as long as I have a good philosophical principle that conflicts with the judgment. I'll always go with the principle. So almost nobody is at either of the two extremes. But there's lots of different places you can be in the middle. So how willing are you to give up a judgment that seems correct to you? Because it doesn't fit with a principle that also seems correct to you. What do you think?
and it's worth thinking about like where do you think wolf fits in here like is she trying to stick with as many of her judgments as she can or is she willing to give up a lot of these uh for the sake of a illuminating or attractive general principle 